morning or afternoon or evening, depending upon where you are, while you watch our webinar. Uh, my name is Jim Mathis, uh, and I'm here today with uh, Vitico de Jong in the first instance, and Martin Denheyer, who's going to join us in a few minutes. We're here to introduce for you and talk to you about the public international law and international trade and investment law tracks at the University of Amsterdam, Amsterdam Law School. I'm going to give this now to Vitika, uh, who's going to talk about the administrative details and some of the admissions aspects of uh, coming to Amsterdam and studying at the UVA. And But before I do, I want to thank you all for coming in today as participants, and we look forward to your questions and the, uh, the webinar. So enjoy it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my name is Vitika. I'm the admissions officer at the international office of the law faculty at the University of Amsterdam. So when you think about doing your master's at the University of Amsterdam, um, you will be in touch with me all the way through the point where you'll actually step foot into our uh, beautiful building. Um, any questions you might have will always come to me. Um, but the intention of today's webinar is also to already answer some of those questions and to give you as much as information as possible so that you feel properly prepared. So for those of you who haven't already applied, uh, the application procedures are as follows. Uh, the deadline to have your application in is the 1st of April. That means you should have done the following three things. Fill in the online application form, hand in all your original application documents and pay the administration fee of 125 euros. If you're not sure which documents to hand in um, or how the payment of the administration fee works or where to find the online application form, you can go to our website als.uva and you find all of the information there. What is good to know is that the deadline of April 1st is quite strict, however, if you, for instance, haven't graduated yet by this time or you've scheduled an English proficiency test that hasn't taken place yet, don't worry, this does not affect your application. Um, as long as you hand in all your other documents and a, a most recent transcript of grades of your current degree before the 1st of April, we will take your application into consideration and the English proficiency test and your final documents of your undergraduate degree, so a statement of graduation or a diploma, and your full transcript of grades, they may be in before the 31st of May. If you have trouble reaching this deadline, please always send me an email and we can talk about it on an individual basis to see what we can do for you. There is a couple of scholarships available for those who need some help financially. Um, it's important to know that these scholarships that we have available are only there for non-EU students who have to pay a higher tuition fee than EU students. And the scholarships that we still have are Amsterdam Merit Scholarship, the Holland Scholarship, and the Orange Tulip Scholarship, which is specifically for Chinese and Korean students. Um, for all the eligibility criteria and application procedures of these scholarships, please again visit our website or send me an email at admissions-als.uva.com.nl, sorry. Um, once you've been admitted at the University of Amsterdam, you obviously want to know where you'll be living. Um, it's important to know that we have student accommodations available and we want to help you out with getting a roof over your ha head. However, we do not guarantee housing. This is because we've only a limited amount of um, uh, accommodations available and it's basically on a first come first serve basis. So you have to be quick to make sure um, to get university housing. Um, it's also important to know that we don't have a classic campus the way you might be used to it at our universities. Um, the student accommodations that we have available are kind of spread across the city. Some are in the city centre, some are a little bit further away, some are with a big flat with other students, some are a little bit more spread. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wide variety of, of um, types of accommodations that are available. Um, Price-wise, it's important to prepare you for this. Um, Amsterdam is not the most expensive, but also not the cheapest city. Um, you can be expected to pay around 400 to 600 euros per month on rent. This goes both for university-arranged housing and if you find something for yourself. 
When you miss out on university arranged housing or you decide for yourself that you want to find something on the private market, you can also ask us. We have some useful websites available, some tips, some ways to get around on the private market. Now, for those who come from the EU and have an EU passport, um, visa and residence permits are easy regulations. There's not much to do. Um, the university will make sure that you will be registered properly. They might ask you to upload your passport here and there, um, but that's it. If you're from outside the EU, obviously it takes a little bit more effort and time. Um, luckily, the university does the application procedure for you. <coughs> Um, so you don't have to start that yourself. However, they do ask you um, to take um, an active approach and upload quite a few documents to get the entire process rolling. Um, it's also uh, a, a connected to a certain fee that you have to pay. Um, to know which documents you have to have prepared for the visa application and how much it's going to cost you, um, you can take again a look at our website. Uh, one more important thing to know about this is, is that there's two different types of uh, visa, um, visa applications. One that takes generally longer than the other, which is, as you can see on the slide, the MVV one. If you fall in this category, you have to make sure that you have everything ready, all the documents, everything prepared by the 31st of uh, May, um, because it's between the 30th, 31st of May and June 15th where application procedures can start any later than that and your visa might ar arrive too late before the start of your semester and obviously that's not very ideal. If you belong to the second get category, VVR, which is countries such as the US, Canada, and New Zealand and all that, um, there's a little bit more leeway but still I would always advise to respond as soon as possible when the University of Amsterdam Student Service Center approaches you about this topic so that you can arrange this as soon as possible. That was basically it for my practical administrative um, bits. As I said before, there's a lot of information on our website. I take a look at als.uva.nl at the practical matters. There is some information about application and procedures, but you can also find course catalog to see what kind of course you'd like to study. Um, practical information about visa and residence permit, it's all <coughs> on there. Um, if you still can't find it, you're always welcome to send me an email. I will make sure to reply to you as soon as possible. In the meantime, um, my colleague will take my place in a little bit. I will be backstage in the chat. If you have any questions regarding the administrative procedures or anything, content, doesn't matter, you can just send it in the chat live and we'll try to answer you as soon as possible. The chat will stay open after the webinar closes for about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you have anything, just let us know. Thank you, Vidika. Very helpful. Let's have uh, Martin come up. Hi, Jim. This is Martin Den Heyer, the coordinator for the Public International Law Track. Hi, Martin. Hi. How are you today? I, I'm pretty okay. Pretty okay. It's nice weather in Amsterdam. Yes, it is. Uh, there you see our names and our email addresses. Uh, and we are going to be working quite a bit off this slide. Uh, you'll be working with it in the beginning. I'll be coming back to it. I just want to say before I turn it over to you for the introduction of public international law, just so the participants can see how this slide works. You look across the top and you'll see that it, there's one master and the master is called international and European law. So one single master is quite a large master. I think there's probably 150, 160 students in this master overall in the whole group. But the master is made up of four separate tracks. Two of the tracks are in European law. One of them is a general European Union law track, which is the webinar that was held uh, earlier this morning here in the studio. And then there's a more specialized track inside of European Union law, which is European competition law and regulation. That works the same way on our side of the masters, which is the public international law side. We have a track, Public International Law, that Martin is going to introduce, uh, that is a more general, has more flexibility in it, and then the specialized track, International Trade and Investment Law. 
all the tracks have a couple of things in common. They all are based on 60 European credits, 60 EC credits. And all the tracks have the same final paper requirement, which is a master's paper, final paper, uh, that is worth 12 EC. So that means that each track, each separate track, is allocating 48 European credits across different courses. All right, I'm going to pass the slide controller to you, and welcome. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, let, let me start by, by running um, quickly through the, the, the program of the public international law track. Um, um, every student, and this is the same for um, Jim's track, International Trade and Investment Law, starts with a general introductory course, which is called Principles and Foundations of International Law. It is an intensive course um, taught in the um, first block of the first semester, which is the first eight weeks, September and October of, uh, of this year, um, in which we run through the basics again. Many of you um, will have done public international law um, before, and we uh, try to revise your knowledge on, on that, um, but also zoom in to the major controversies within the field of public international law. We, we feel that every student needs to have this overview to be able to specialize further later on in the program. Um, apart from that, there is a compulsory element, namely um, what we call the optional compulsory courses. Um, three of them, um, and you, m you must choose one of those three. These three courses are on the basics on some core areas of international law, and you, we feel that you have to be um, proficient in at least one of those. So those are international organization, international dispute settlement, and international responsibility, what we used to call state responsibility. Um, you eventually get a degree um, in um, the LLM, International and European Law, which means that we also do require you to have some knowledge of EU law. Now, we make sure of that by obliging you to choose one, as we call it, crossover elective, um, which is a course in EU law. And this is the same for International Trade and Investment Law, mm -hmm. only the list of courses, EU courses, um, with Jim is a bit um, smaller than um, with us. There are around six or seven EU courses is told by our EU colleagues which you have to choose from one of those. Um, and then, and I think this is the, the best part of our program, um, uh, a broad option of electives, I'll come to those in, in a moment, uh, you, you, you have to choose up to 24 EC of electives, um, and within this, this field um, of 24 EC it is also possible for you to do an internship. Um, and indeed everyone concludes with a thesis. Let, let me um, say a little bit about the subject of international, public international law itself. Why would you choose to do um, public international law? I take it that, that most of you are obviously interested in, in public international law, otherwise you would um, probably not be watching um, this webinar. Um, I, I will not say many things about international law. L let me just say that indeed public international law is all around us and becomes increasingly important. If one looks, for example, at the uh, current um, crisis in Syria. Um, the major issues there are governed by international law. Is it legal um, to intervene in Syria? Um, the way Russia um, bombs certain areas uh, within Syria, is that in compliance with international humanitarian law? I think about all the refugees coming to Europe, for example. Are we obliged by international law to protect them? And what does protection mean in terms of international law? Um, but also, on a much more mundane level, I think international law uh, is all around us and, and um, invades all kinds of areas also of national law, civil law, criminal law, administrative law. My own field of expertise is, uh, is refugee law. Um, and, and, well, let us take the Syrian refugees again. It is estimated that around 1.5 million refugees um, have entered the European Union last year, and that means in practice that 1.5 million times it has to be checked whether that person meets the definition of a refugee in a refugee convention. So international law is applied on a daily basis in um, virtually all countries in the world, and especially so in, uh, in, in, in Europe. Um, moving on 
to the next obvious question. If you um, want to do international law, why would you do it in Amsterdam? Um, and there are a number of good reasons, I think, for, 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 for choosing UvA as your university. First of all, um, we have, especially if you compare to other universities in uh, law schools in the Netherlands, we have a um, teaching staff with, which is um, quite large. We have one of the largest research groups in international law um, in the Netherlands. Um, we publish often in international um, journals. Our research is closely connected to our education, and we have experts in pretty much um, all fields, all sub-areas of international law. Um, we have also, I, I should perhaps add, been, been, um, an, uh, been, been given the title of Center of Excellence uh, of the University of Amsterdam, which shows how important the university um, thinks about um, international law. There is um, a great asset about doing public international law in Amsterdam, which is the flexibility of the program. And, and, and this is, is mainly because of the large amount of electives we, we have on, on offer, and I'll come to those electives um, in a minute. You're really flexible to, to specialize in, in one particular area of international law, for example, human rights or international criminal law. All that is on offer in our program. Um, we have an international classroom this year. Um, we have around 90 students. Um, uh, around half of them are, are Dutch and, and half non-Dutch. Students really coming from, from every continent of, uh, uh, of, of this planet. And, and that makes for a great mixture and an opportunity to familiar, familiarize yourself with, with other cultures. And um, much good, uh, much good com comes out of that. And uh, I personally enjoy very much working with, with students from different cultures. And finally, we are in Amsterdam, which is, I think, good for two reasons. First of all, because it is a very nice city. I hope you agree with me on that, Easily. Jim. Uh, I've been living in myself in Amsterdam for, for, for a couple of years. Um, I still enjoy it every day. Culturally vibrant city. Um, there's much to do um, after um, uh, you've done w with studying. Um, but I think also, um, in terms of the content of our program, Amsterdam is um, very well located because it is in the Netherlands, because it is close to The Hague, The Hague sometimes called the legal capital of the world, with all the international organizations, international tribunals located there. And that offers opportunities in our education as well, study trips um, to those organizations or tribunals. You can choose to do an internship there, and sometimes uh, judges, for example, of the International Criminal Court or the International Court of Justice um, give guest, guest lectures, um, so it, it is um, very nice to be located closely to the place where international law is implemented and made in, in The Hague. Now, um, before I, I hand over um, to, to, to Jim, um, let me run through the list of electives we, we have on offer because I, I think that this is one of the most wonderful parts of our program, the liberty for you um, to zoom into one area or perhaps to go into a multi multiple fields of international law. Um, I, I've grouped the electives um, by theme and by, by subfield. Um, International criminal law, we, we have um, three courses on offer there, um, uh, offered by our colleagues from criminal law. We specialize in international criminal law, mainly uh, Professor uh, Harman van der Wild and Professor Joran Sluiter. Joran Sluiter um, is also a, a lawyer with, with a big law firm in, in the Netherlands, defending um, persons um, who stand trial um, in the Hague at the International Criminal Court. So three courses zooming into that area that um, is of increasing importance, um, international criminal law. We have um, three courses which are um, within the field of human rights law. Um, again, different experts. Professor Dunders teaches the course, which is really popular international human rights law, zooming mainly into UN uh, human rights treaties and treaty supervisory bodies of the United Nations. European human rights law, zooming into mostly European Convention and the European Court of Human Rights, but also um, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and a wonderful course um, on international refugee law taught by, who is now our interim dean, Professor Marlene Ziek. Um, three courses 
on um, international humanitarian law. And those are special because um, these courses are also part of the program to be followed by officers of the Dutch Military Academy. So the, these courses are also um, followed by persons in uniform. With, with, uh, um, and you, you will sit next to them in the classroom. Um, Victims of War is a new course um, offered for the first time this year, um, taught by Professor Lisbeth uh, Zegveld, who is a, a well-known lawyer in, in the Netherlands, um, lawyer in, in um, quite high-profile cases, such as the Mothers of Srebrenica case. I think it, it, it is a wonderful course. It, it will start next block, and we will certainly keep it next year. One more slide with, with electives. Um, Jim's courses, of course, and he will talk about trade and investment law in a minute. Um, we, there are a couple of practice-oriented courses. We um, greatly appreciate it if theory, the theory and the textbook knowledge of international law is brought into, into practice. We have a number of courses facilitating that. The, the law clinic, in which we work on projects um, um, of third parties, such as law firms, who ask us to delve into, to do some research into particular issues which may help them win a case, um, and you will be <coughs> assigned to a particular project um, if you try, if you opt for that course. We have the uh, Jessup Moot Court, of course. Amsterdam always participates in the, um, the, 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 the most well-known public international law Moot Court, and we recently won our team of five students the national round, and our students will go to, to Washington, um, I believe, in two weeks to hope to do um, very well in the international round as well. The WTO Moot Court, which is also um, within uh, Jim's program, um, we, we do well on that as well. I think Jim can say a little more about that. Um, and the possibility to do an internship. Um, and, and, and most students who are interested in the internship um, do not uh, face many obstacles in finding a, a good internship, which is partly due to well, all the opportunities um, the Netherlands has on offer within the area of international law. And three, miscellaneous courses, finally, history and theory of international law, international environmental law, told by um, Professor Le Faber, who is a um, um, specialist in environmental law and works for the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, because he's also um, part-time appointed at UvA. And finally, a wonderful course tour told by Professor Pieter Jan Kuipers, um, United Nations, the law in action. P Peter Jan is one of our retired professors, um, but has worked pretty much all his life with international organizations all over the world, United Nations, um, European Commission, WTO, and um, this course zooms into the internal organization and the internal challenges um, of the United Nations. Um, I have one slide left on career prospect before I hand over. Um, you have something to say about this as well. Let, let me just, mm. just say that, that um, I think career prospects for those um, having a degree in international law are, are, are good, much better than, than perhaps um, 10, 20 years ago. Um, one reason for that is indeed that international law invades all kinds of other um, areas of law um, as well. Um, and of course, um, you can greatly enhance your career opportunities um, by making certain choices um, w w while studying here, doing um, extracurricular activities, doing an internship at a particular organization, and of course, getting uh, good grades helps as well. Jim, back to you. Okay. You know, it's quite impressive when you look at this list of electives. It's hard to imagine that if you're going to study public international law, you can actually find a catalog that's more extensive than this catalog. And I mean in the world. I, I'm <laughs> very, not, very not just in it. the Netherlands. It's, 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 uh, it's amazing. But of course, that's one of the things that the, Uni of Amsterdam, the University of Amsterdam does well. We are large, and that means we have a larger faculty, and that means we have a lot of courses. But it doesn't mean that all of our courses are crammed with, with uh, massive quantities of students. These are tracks. Uh, get refined, and in the second semester courses we're running, I think we have 25 to 35 students in a course. That's typical. We, we, we have a, a total group within uh, my track of 90 students, but, but, but indeed that, that splits up, and even in the compulsory courses we ensure that there are smaller groups, yeah. no more than 40 students, and this is the case as well yeah. in the electives, of course, which ensures interaction be between the teachers yeah. and the students. So it's basically normal classroom size groups, maybe a bit larger than what you'd have for a small seminar, 
for most of them, but uh, they're not they're not massive uh, barnyard classes with uh, with 185 students sitting in a room. We only run those large groups on the introduction courses, but then again, we have study groups that break down into smaller groups. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about international trade and investment law. This is also a branch of public international law. Uh, as you saw, it, some of these courses in my track could be taken in the public international law master's program, which means clearly you can specialize in a sense by just taking the general public international law master's and then picking up a few of these international economic law courses as you want to. That's quite possible. However, what happens with my track uh, is that most students come into it, they want to have a specialization. So the diploma that finalizes is International and European Law Masters with a track designated International Trade and, and Investment Law. Now I'll talk a little bit about what is International Trade and Investment Law uh, in a moment, but why do people come into this track and what is it that they are have in common uh, when they study this subject area. It's trade law and investment law is a mix of law. It's treaty law. It's public international law, state to state, organization to organizations, state to organizational law. But it's also very economic law in that the idea of the treaties is normally to try to meet an economic objective of some kind. Uh, liberalizing markets, trying to open the investment market, trying to open markets for service providers or for goods or for food supplies uh, from developing countries. These are all what we call market access issues. And the dynamic, the context is somewhat economic that way. That doesn't mean that the lawyers who, who work in the field are economists, but they do understand something along the way of what is the context of what they're negotiating for and what they're, what they're trying to interpret uh, when they interpret an international treaty. The other aspect, though, is because it is very about negotiations. And the treaties that result from these negotiations, it is an inherently political area, and people are drawn to the area because of its high politics. It's state-to-state -state trade negotiations and uh, in many trade negotiations, there's not more, much more that can be at stake than the positions of the industries and the firms of the countries involved and how the negotiations play out. And we know this from, uh, from the fact that, uh, that the law of globalization is dynamic and expanding. We see so much attention to trade agreements going up over the last two to three years, and this is just the recent cycle of agreements we have a very large trade agreement uh, that's been entered by 10 uh, countries in Asia and the United States included, and uh, South America and Canada uh, called the uh, Transatlantic Pacific uh, Partnership, the TPP. This is not yet ratified in the United States, but will be incredibly uh, controversial as it goes to ratification. Here in the European Union, we're negotiating a trade agreement now with the United States also the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Uh, it's controversial in the United States, and it's controversial here as well, even while the negotiations proceed over the period of, uh, yeah, they've been going on now for two years, and perhaps they, uh, they finish up this year. Why controversial? What's controversial about these uh, trade agreements and what makes them uh, the focus of so much public attention? Always in this field, at least in the modern times, there's a tension between the societal values and the tensions between what the market is demanding. And we see this on issues all over, trade and environment issues. Uh, we prohibit the importation of seal products, baby seal products in the European Union. That becomes a trade case. We have a value. We have a moral value, and we say, no, we don't want uh, the seal products in the, uh, from, from countries where the seals are harvested in a manner that is objectionable to us. But that becomes a trade case, because the market says, yes, but our seals should be allowed to, to, uh, to have entry into the market. 
or how we label uh, our dolphin safe tuna uh, and whether we label that in a manner that forms an unnecessary barrier to trade or in intellectual property rights, a, a developing countries' right to have access to medicines in a health emergency, like an HIV emergency or a Zika emergency. Uh, how does a country exercise its rights to suspend a patent holder's rights to be paid for the patent on their pharmaceutical product? Or, for example, uh, what we have uh, happening now in Australia, but also soon to come to Europe, uh, highly restrictive cigarette uh, uh, package labeling, where the brand names can no longer be shown or the brand identification colors can no longer be used. Uh, is that an infringement of copyright? Is that an unnecessary trade barrier uh, that prevents the company from <coughs> accessing the market as it, as it has agreed to do under the trade agreement terms? Uh, in this respect, most of the students that are writing now for papers and that are putting in final topics with me are working on issues and topics <coughs> like this. Uh, normally trade and environment, trade and human rights, trade and culture, trade and uh, right to medicines, these types of topics. Why trade and investment law at the University of Amsterdam? Well, we are also, we share some of the uh, same characteristics as does Martin's program in public international law. We are a very much an international student uh, environment. My track, uh, in particular, uh, probably has the highest number of non-Dutch students in it. Not that we don't love our Dutch students in our tracks. We do, absolutely for sure. But let me just give you some sense of how this is. We've got 42 students in the track this year. Uh, one third of my students are Dutch students. Who, in other words, they're bachelor students who have come from other Dutch universities uh, to stay in Amsterdam. And I've had Dutch students tell me when they've been in this track through the course of the year, they said, I wanted to have an international environment. I wanted to work, uh, study in an international environment but I was quite surprised I could just come to Amsterdam and be in an international environment because in the classroom and in the group that is going through the track, people are from all over. Uh, and it makes, of course, for the most interesting experience possible for a student. It really enhances the quality <coughs> of the experience a student has. At the same time, it also provides the, the basis for what becomes for most of the students in these tracks, a network that goes on with them for years and years after they finish the studies here. People become very close friends. They've gone through the experience together. I'm gonna to meet a group in May that is coming back here for their 25th anniversary alumni meeting, uh, having been in this track back in 1990. And that's the kind of way people hold together uh, the network and the friendships that they have here. Another aspect of the track is the track is uh, uniquely case intensive, both in WTO law, which is World Trade Organization trade law, and in investment law, uh, mainly operating uh, cases under the bilateral investment treaties. We have cases all the time. Uh, the arbitration cases are flowing, a number of cases, uh, panels being ruled every month. In trade law, we're getting 40 and 50 uh, panels a year in the WTO. There's always changes in the law to digest. The law is always moving. In that sense, it's a very dynamic field because it's very case busy, which is a great thing for teachers because there's always something new to teach and of course it's very interesting for students because there's always something new that's opening up and happening in the field. <clears throat> All the tracks in the Masters International and European Law operate with uh, excursions and make sure that students are exposed to something else besides just our classrooms. For my own track, uh, we take students to Geneva 
uh, in May, and we go to WTO, and we go to three or four other organizations that deal with international economic law, including a law firm that does nothing but WTO uh, panel law practice in Geneva, specialized law firm. We also have our own moot court, which is the ELSA, European Law Students Association, WTO moot court, and they join as a participant, as with Martin's uh, track, the UBA Law Clinic. The WTO moot court, we've, we've had very successful teams over the last three years. We've been in the Geneva finals each year of the competition Last year, I think that there were in excess of 80 teams arguing the case globally, and we made it into the top eight and finished quite well in Geneva. So we have had very strong moot court teams. And of course, the experience for those students who selected for moot court and are good enough to be on it, uh, it is an incredible experience because they really are <laughs> meeting the people who are going to be the people in the field that they will deal with as they stay uh, as they stay in international trade law. The UVA Law Clinic is something that's totally unique to uh, to the University of Amsterdam and to our track. Uh, these are real cases, real clients, real problems, and the students act like real lawyers under the supervision of uh, one of the instructors, and prepare real legal materials. So it is a hands-on practice oriented experience uh, and it's incredibly valuable for students to have it. Our career path is uh, similar uh, to public international law, international and regional organizations. EU students that come through my track and want to stay in trade tend to work in the uh, European Commission uh, or one of the national ministries or they'll go to a government uh, ministry Law firms specializing in international trade and investment law, of course, and in companies. Non-governmental organizations is a growth area for us uh, because there are so many NGOs dealing with trade and environment and trade and development rights, uh, these sorts of uh, aspects, many of them based in the Netherlands. Uh, and, of course, further academic study. Uh, we know our placement rate is quite good. However, I let you show you this number, but I want to put the caveat on it. This is just for all of our tracks. This is not just for my own track. We, after four months uh, in year two, 2014, we had uh, students either in an internship or a job uh, at a placement rate of around 80%. For those in contact, with our job coach, our career services. But that's the caveat, is the ones who are in contact with the career services tend to be people who are staying in the Netherlands. They may also tend to be Dutch students, and of course they're operating, looking for employment in their home market. So it really quite depends upon your own destination, your own country of origin, your language skills, and of course your scores in the course and what you want to do and what you're trying to open up for yourself. Okay, well, I'm going to look at the screen here, and we've got a good 20 minutes left for questions, and I hope the, the we're, here, we're here to talk about content. Uh, Vitika's here to help with uh, the admi administration questions, but please, uh, we've covered the courses now for you, and we'd, we'd love to hear your questions in terms of the content of the course, the operation of the course, anything else you want to know about it, and we'll just sit here and read the screen and see what we can see what we can answer for you. And thank you very much. Yeah, there, there are uh, thanks indeed. Um, but perhaps we, we can take up uh, one or two questions, Jim, which are on, on screen. Uh, Timothy, uh, so I saw ask two questions. Um, one is about what is on the uh, diploma. Does it only say um, that you have completed the master in international and European law, or does it also list the track on the diploma? It indeed lists also. Uh, it says specifically which track you follow. So, so I think we we have addressed that one. And then there is a question on whether um, the electives are on a first-come, first-serve basis and whether there is a cap in the number of students that may uh, enroll in a particular uh, elective. Um, 
none of our electives has a cap um, apart from the practice oriented electives so um, you indeed um, have to apply and are selected on a competitive basis for the practice courses which are um, the Jessup Mood Court um, which is the uh, law clinic and which is the WWTO Mood Court for all the other electives there is um, no cap so if you enroll um, before the deadline um, you are gu guaranteed a place no. Just adding on to that, a supplement in that, the diploma indicates international and European law masters and then the designation of the track, as you just said. And then there's also, it is accompanied by the certificate that has all the courses, and our certificate provides also the title of the student's final paper, which is keys a CV very much into the subject area of what the student was was focusing on in the concentration as they completed the school year. So that's also helpful to try to orient uh, your, yourself as you move into the job market or internship market after school. Okay, what else have we got? Could you give us an example of how the schedule will be the first three months for a student who is working but would like to study at full time? Working and full time, I have to be honest with you, it's not easy. You cannot to do, do that. two things full time because there is only one full time, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. We do. I we every year we have students who are taking the course half time or part time, and they're carving it. So, for example, in our first block, uh, each block lasts uh, eight weeks, seven weeks of sessions, and then a week of exams. In our first block. Both of our tracks are having principles and foundations of public international law. That's, a, that's an intensive course. Uh, it's two lecture sessions a week plus a study group session, a work group session a week. So that's six hours a week in the course. But it's also the case... And this plus is for preparation, huh? Preparation. Plus, plus, plus preparation, time, yeah, because huh? the course is moving fast. Uh, so there's a lot of reading that at least doubles that time. You, know, you must keep up during during the course. Um, it yeah. doesn't work if you start studying yeah. Yeah. only for the exam one week before it. Oh. Yeah. So between between uh, being in class plus preparation, you're probably looking at a 15 hour week. Uh, Certainly, we, uh, uh, at least, at least. Yeah, at uh, least. I, I would okay. say perhaps no. the good students have, have uh, uh, tw 20 hours sufficient, but, but, but others may, may even need okay. um, 25 hours to, to just keep up with, with all the materials. So that course is, that course is a, is a part-time, is a half-time job. If it's 20 hours a week, that's a half-time job. Now, that said, a lot of students who are trying to work for 10 or 12 hours a week, which, I, which does happen, a lot of students work, uh, hold jobs, uh, they're able to hold that 10 or 12 hours a week and do that, make that combination play. And also in that first set, because it is intensive, they're not taking other courses. They won't draw to another elective or try to fill in one of their electives in that set. No, no. They'll just basically say, no, this is 12 EC, this is enough for eight weeks. The, no. following, uh, the following eight weeks, they'll take another two courses. Uh, and, and fill in the same way, or maybe three. Maybe they'll take an elective on their, on their second block. So, but two full-time jobs at the same time, it's difficult, and I, it's not easy to resolve that. I agree. Just to, to, to add a little bit about the first months of the program, indeed, um, the idea is that um, everyone starts and only follows this introductory course, Principles and Foundations, in the first block of eight weeks. Yet there are always students who want to do more, have no other job. Um, and for those, we've decided, and we start with that next year, to also offer in the first um, block um, the elective theory uh, of, of international uh, okay. law, history and theory of international law, and that is to make sure that, that those yeah. students who, who, who are uh, who are good and who don't need as much time as uh, as others um, uh, can follow another course as well. Okay, good. Is it possible to start a master in February, and in this case, how long does a taught master degree take? That's a good question. Uh, do you want me to start, take it up? 
uh, around. Uh, I, I could take up, uh, up as well. Um, yeah, I, I generally uh, advise it, it is indeed possible to start to start a master in in, in February. Um, I generally advise against it because you follow the program in the reverse order. Um, the um, three core courses of which you have to choose one, and the general introductory course are offered at fixed moments um, throughout the year. Um, so logically, if you start in February, you would first do all the more specialized electives and do the more introductory level courses um, later on from September to February uh, onwards. So it, it can make it a little bit more difficult. Yet yeah, we always have students, um, uh, I think around 10, between 10 to 15, who opt for the possibility in, uh, to start in February. Um, and uh, I, I do not encounter major obstacles in that respect. And um, in terms of time, th th they can still complete the masters within one year. Yeah. Uh, speaking from my own track, similar, although uh, I've had good experiences with students coming in February. Every year, like I said, I've got 40 students this year. I've got five who started in February. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's several students. And when they come in, they know they have to do some pre-reading because we've already finished our general courses in WTO law and basic investment law. And we're moving on to the part of the, of the year where students have a choice to either stay in both trade and investment, do it both, or say, no, I only want to study investment now, so I'll take investment arbitration. Or I only want to study WTO law now, so I'll take the advanced WTO course. So they're, the rest of the group is already making that cut. They're making those choices based upon the introductory courses they had in the first semester. So that puts a February student in a little bit of a tricky position, but at the same time, if they do some pre-reading, which is available, we, uh, we try to facilitate that, they, can, they get with the group and they get with the flow quite okay. Also for the February students, as it is for all students, we have a final paper course that runs from when they st start their enrollment that takes us through the sequence for the skills courses, the selection of topics, the selection of supervision for the final papers. This is all also operates like a course, and that course is started distinctly in February for the February enrollments. So they're not put at disadvantage or put behind the group in regard to how they're handling their final paper. The course for those students is also over in the single academic year. The papers are filed, final papers, drafts are filed uh, very early January and those papers are marked out uh, and finalized for, for the diploma before February. So it, it's, a, it's also a 12 month academic course the same way it is for the students that start in September. Good questions. There, there is another question of, uh, of Timothy. Um, the website indicates that some exams will be conducted in written exams and oral, and are those written, open book, or closed book, and what are oral exams? Perfect. Um, um, oral exams are, are rare. Um, I don't know within my track any course um, which has oral exams as a rule. They are offered as an exception, for example, if due to all kinds of unforeseen circumstances a student has been unable um, to, to do the exam um, also in, 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 in the retake, or when um, um, perhaps there, there is um, one um, course left to be able to graduate and then we may organize an oral exam to, to, to fill up that gap. Um, are they open book or closed book? Um, depends entirely on the course. There are open book exams and, and, and closed book uh, exams, and, and uh, I think quite evenly distributed. Um, and the other question was the orgs are they presentation based or or Q and A basis? Um, in, in, you are obliged, and, and, and uh, that is the only. Um, presentation-based exam I'm aware of, you are obliged to defend your master thesis um, before the professors and other students, which takes about five or between five and ten 
minutes and if you are uh, have to do an oral exam for one of the courses instead of a written exam there are they, they will be q a uh, based okay thank you i've got one here that i'm going to take up considering the huge influence of the trade and econ economics in our competitive world makes it easier for a graduate to find a job in this area when we stay in the netherlands question mark I mean, is there an important labor market for us once we get the degree? I'm going to just say very, uh, very clearly on this that the labor market for students varies tremendously upon the individual situation of the student. And that's, it is so unique to your own particular profile that I can't generalize and say, yeah, the Dutch labor market is this way for everybody, or the Dutch labor market is this way for no one. It's very distinct. I've got students, uh, for example, I have Chinese students uh, from the last three years who have all stayed and are working at, at uh, Dutch banks that are doing business in Chinese markets. They, found a, they have found a place here to basically exercise their Chinese, their Chinese uh, language skills and writing skills are obviously a key to that, to that, that employment for them together with the combination they've gotten from the course. So that puts them in the Dutch market, in the international financial services market. That's, that's not the same for someone else. Uh, and a Dutch student who, has, uh, who is a, a native Dutch speaker, that student might be operating in a law firm that is working primarily with Dutch clients, doing international transactions or international investment law of some kind. So it's so specific. Some students clearly find there are better opportunities in their home markets where they can basically work uh, into their own ministries or, as the case may be, working in regional economic organizations or international economic organizations, including those based in Geneva. They're very competitive. They're not easy to get into. And those who uh, go into competition for the, uh, the, the placements in the European Commission. So I, I'm, uh, it's... Yes, there is a Dutch labor market, but how one has the skills to be a good part of it, I can't say unless somebody really analyzes your own individual CV, and that is after you finish the course, because the marks and the performance of the course are very much a big part of, of how well you do in the labor market. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. There is another one from uh, Jorrit Postuma. Uh, does the master offer extra possibilities or courses for excellent students, the, the same as with, with the honors track in, in the Bachelor of, uh, of the UVA uh, yeah. uh, Law School? Uh, good, good question. Um, we have not, not a thing like um, courses or tutorials specifically re reserved for honor students or very good students, so um, the program is the same for all of our students. Yeah, um, you are invited, if, if you um, feel like it, to, to do extra courses. There is not a maximum of the of number of courses you can follow, so you can indeed um, follow, and this will also be on your transcript, extra or more electives than, than others do. Um, and and uh, I spoke already about the, the, the first eight weeks, um, precisely because there were some students who said, well, this introductory course, principles and foundations, uh, I, I would like to do something else beside that course in the first eight weeks. There, there is now also an elective on offer in, in that first, first block. And of course, you can also do more internships if you like, um, and you can also engage in activities outside of the program, for example, become a member of the study organization, uh, <coughs> the student organization, in ASA International Law um, and become active there and it organizes a study trip for example and all kinds of um, nice activities such as uh, lectures and also some uh, drinks uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the evening sometimes. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to add to that also if I can. Uh, the way our program is designed is we're focusing on academic writing or legal English, uh, legal analysis in writing. And our model for what is a, an excellent paper uh, and a good paper uh, really are, is a law article model, a, a law article in English. And that's what we are pushing the students to get to because that is what we can assess for them when we give them a reference for an employment application and say, this student is an outstanding researcher and an outstanding writer. Those are the 
primary skills that are being brought uh, into the job market for an employer. That said, uh, every year in both these programs we're in, we get students who just do outstanding uh, final papers or write outstanding case reviews and we recommend them in for publication. Uh, in my track, as it is the case in European Union law, uh, we have our own journal. It's not an in-house journal. It's a commercial international journal called Legal Issues of Economic Integration. And we publish a couple of final papers a year in the form of articles uh, or case notes in the form of case reviews. And I know uh, from the investment side that, uh, that we have uh, instructors making referrals for students to publish into the arbitration report journals. These publications are fantastic for student CVs. If you draw an academic publication as a student at a master's level, uh, it opens doors. There's no question that it's a very powerful item to have. But of course, getting there, right, being a good enough writer to get there is, uh, is the challenge. But that is what we're actually challenging students to try to do in the programs. Certainly, certainly. Yeah. No. And then a really difficult one, Jim, from, from Miriam uh, Moya, what is the average grade score to study the Master of Public International Law? I think the, the, the question is, I, I have no idea what is the this, this is. This is an admission yeah. question. Yeah. We're going to let Vidika answer yeah. what the, how, how we handle that, you know, yeah. whether we are an open enrollment system or whether we have thresholds. I know we have a scoring system, but we, I don't run the admissions office, and I don't, <laughs> I don't know it. Huh. Yeah. But uh, I think Vidical uh, can probably answer that one in for you. And uh, there are no more, more questions I, I, I see. Um, yet you, you can still um, question us, um, but, but I think it, it, it's for us now time to, um, to, say, good, to say goodbye. And then yeah. Vidical will take over with, with questions. And if there are questions on content, um, we will come back to you. Um, Thank you very much and on, yeah. on my behalf for, for, for being with us with this webinar. Um, I enjoyed it. I hope you did. Um, there is one thing uh, I would like to remind of them that um, there is a poll on the site Good and we you. hope that you will fill in that poll um, because it informs us about your needs and whether we have satisfied your needs with, with this uh, webinar. Um, thanks very much and I, I hope to see you all in, uh, in Amsterdam in, uh, in September next year. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Thank yeah, you, Jim. And uh, we hope you enjoyed it. And thank you for joining us. Bye. Yeah, bye bye.